So I was arguing with a Orthodox Christian about eternal damnation. Yeah, some guy butted in and he's talking about. Well, he said he said that I said that hell is a false doctrine. And he says hell is a reality and in scripture. And I said I'm talking. This is when I specified what I meant. As I told him I'm talking about eternal damnation. And he needs, he responds with talking about. Uh, the ex there exists a rea in reality that first hell is not a created place with some created fires and flames, but actually the view of God's majestic glory, not as light, but as fire. And he quotes Second Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. And I said, hell is created, I said, quote, created, end quote, for the devil and his angels. Uh, they're not the same, hell. That goes to the idea where I'm coming at it from is that hell is like a temporal place of being because it's due to sin, right? How he was, this guy was saying how it relates to how you experience God or something. And I said, well, then hell would be technically created because sin is like not everlasting. Only what is everlasting is uncreated. And so the eternal fire, right, should, should not be confused with the hell of sin, death, and Satan, that which is created hell. It's built on like torment and wickedness being consumed from the being of man, right? Causes a temporal condition uh, called hell or experience or something like that. Because, uh, you know, uh, hopefully I think I fleshed that out better when I was responding to him. So I just want to continue. Like, he says, uh, no wrong, the original language text, verse does not say created, for hell is coined Greek. Nowhere scripture shows that hell is a created place with created fires and flames. That claim is a pagan claim. Hell is actually the view of God's majestic, uncreated glory as fire. And I said, I responded to him with, the majestic glory isn't the hell of sin, death, and Satan, which is spiritual death outside the kingdom, not inside. You're, you're saying wicked people receive such a glory. Is it for the sons of God? It, it is for the sons of God. It cannot be a place of torment. And then he responds with, uh, Well, Scripture says different from you in the original language. Keeps quoting Second Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. It's actually of you, and he gives me these words, and I think in Greek or something. This is the fire of flames is something, the glory. And he says, Hell is actually God himself. Yeah, he says, Um, well, scripture says different from you in the original language, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, 9. And he says that hell is actually God himself to the wicked. Uh, they experience him as fire. Hebrews 12, 29. <laughs> I responded with, The eternal hell then cannot be eternally dying. That would be eternal spiritual death, which is from sin, and not, the, not God nor his glory. The wicked don't receive his glory. And he says the wicked see the glory as fire, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, 9 original language text, uh, God is actually, that's what he responded with, he says, the, the wicked see the glorious fire. He keeps quoting that version, he says, he says, God is actually heaven and God is hell. In reality, God loves all and sent his, his glory and love to all, but all don't love him and others. Uh, those people who experience God as fire, not because God is a sadist on them, but because they have hate in their hearts and demonic ego. Well, hating God is sin, and sin is not eternal, like I said. So, he says, when we say kingdom of God, that actually is not a good translation. It's just a term. It's just some Greek term. It's just in the original language. He says, the text of the New Testament, we mean the glory of God. First Thessalonians 2.12. It says, we are called for that. It says, he also, Peter says, he will tell us about the so-called kingdom of God. In 2 Peter 1.11. 12, then, thir uh, and 1, something, he says something. Uh, it says about the majestic glory as Christ's transfiguration on the holy mount. That is the kingdom in Matthew, Mark, Luke. And Jesus Christ said, Truly I say to you, there are here some that would see the kingdom of God before they die, just after we have the transfiguration of Jesus Christ in glory, and all three gospel on the on the mount. That is actually the so-called uh, the so-called as the kingdom of God. I know he worded it differently. I mean, he worded it, he worded it weird. And he continues, he says, If you go to the Hebrews 12.29, it 
They say they're about God as fire. At first, it seems that there's no connection with. He gave me this other verse. He gave me these numbers. 1227, 28. But I don't know what he's talking about. But he says, in reality, it has because it is now we could will experience the uncreated kingdom of God. And I don't know. Is this, is this supposed to be Hebrews 12, 27, 28? So he believes that the wicked will experience the kingdom of God. And I said, no, they don't. I said, they're outside the kingdom. I keep stressing this, but he doesn't understand that what he's saying is not from Scripture. I said, the kingdom of God. Like, what did I say? I said, I responded to him with, yeah, those in the kingdom are the people who have the union with God, with Christ. The wicked are tormented in the presence of God and his holy angels, and also saints. I said, the wicked remain outside the kingdom. If it were the case that the fire of God depends on your predisposition in your soul, I don't see how a man will ever repent since that would mean that they are hardened in sin rather than purification. I said, no one could possibly be saved because of their own will being fallen. Yeah, because how can the fire of God, like, I don't know how to say it, deify sin in the soul or cause sin to put on incorruption, right, where it cannot be changed? I don't see how the presence of God do that. Is the presence of God consumed with evil, destroy with evil, the old man? So it does not harden the old man in his, in his current state. In his current state... But saves it, saves the state of being, so to say. And I continue with, the wicked are neither in the kingdom nor have the glory. And I told him, God is eternal fire, and so technically he is the cause of eternal hell, regardless of one's hatred for God or not. So such a, a God cannot possibly save anyone, anyone wicked, since his love hardens them. I said no such thing as that in scripture, because the eternal fire consumes wickedness. By purifying the soul of evil, not hardening it in, in them. So no possibility of eternally consuming sin, that which is dead and without everlasting value, which is also known as spiritual death. And I responded, I kept responding, yeah, I continue, um, I said, The kingdom of God isn't hell for anyone, only the people of God live there. The wicked don't, they're outside the kingdom under the severe testing, the fiery trials uh, that purify those who are wicked. Yeah, because the idea is, as it says in the Bible, that you shall not enter the kingdom of God except by fire. And then as it says in, uh, in the book of Peter, it says when God sends you uh, or, um, sends you fiery trials, think of it as not strange. Yeah, it's meant to purify the soul. It's not meant to harden sin. And so that's not the, that's, uh, yeah, it says the, very, the fiery trials purify those who are wicked. That's not the same as spiritual death, the apathy of the soul, where movement ceases. That is due to sin and wickedness, which is which hell are you speaking of? Yeah, because I'm confused. What hell are you talking about? I said, there's literally two definitions of hell now. The hell of God and the hell of Satan. And, he's, and he responds to me and says, where is, where is scripture? It says, God is the cause of eternal fire. Show me the verse. Don't forget I read only the original language text of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. I don't know why he keeps saying that. He, he reads from the original languages. And he says, Spiritual death, as you mentioned, means not to have the energy of the Holy Spirit acting in you. And he, he continues and says, I show you scripture. Yeah, this is, this is, I, he thinks I'm avoiding 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. This is the wicked will experience fire. That is actually how they experience the glory. The glory of God is everywhere. Like my position is that eternal damnation is not true. And so when you speak of eternal hell, you are not speaking of the hell of sin, death, and Satan. You're obviously talking about God himself, the fire. And so how does that lead to eternal damnation? And so I continue. He says to me, yeah, this is him talking. He's continuing what he said. He said, the issue is you believe hell is a creative place with creative fires and flames. I believe what scripture says that it is how some will experience God's glory. See it as fire. And I responded to him. I said, I'm saying if God is eternal fire, then in the presence of his is a fire. Sinners are tormented because of, according to you, his union with his uh, with his union with sinners. Since you believe they're in the kingdom, having the union, that is why God is the cause of their torment. I said, those who want no union are given union without freedom of choice. Another problem for the free will defense. They're tormented in hell against your free will by having a union with God that was never desired by them to begin with. Like, and he says, he responds to me, and he says, I write what Scripture says. Not as what you think in your mind. The fire is actually the view of God. Uh, God's glory. He keeps talking about Second Thessalonians one seven nine. 
And so I'm focused on the idea. Like I think I deal with that scripture later, but I'm focused on what he's saying. How his idea is not from scripture. And so Second Thessalonians is most likely not teaching what he's saying. And then he keeps keeps saying to me, he says, Where you got the not freedom of the wicked? God is at every place, so they in their free will will not want actually to experience the glory of God because they love none and but that they stay in their selfish ego eternal. See the demons they have free will, but will suffer from God glory as they see it as fire. That's how he words it. He says <clears throat> they and their free will. It's like it's not it's like the the whole point of the union is the recapitulation of the Logos. Everything goes back into God because of Jesus. So it is a consequence of Christ's action, his obedience. So whether one lives righteously or not, you end up back in God's presence because of Jesus. How does that fit into your free will idea? And so, and I said, No, the wicked don't receive the glory. Loving sin and living a life of sin is uh, automatically puts you outside the kingdom. Since you think you can be wicked and automatically be glorified, their free will is violated no matter how much you stress about their own ill will. They're unified to God against their will while also doing the will of the evil one, and yet in the kingdom without yet they're in the kingdom without even doing the will of God. That's what you're saying. That yeah, because the idea is like they're constantly saying how people who believe in the biblical universalism, how we say we're how they think we say that everyone is just automatically saved. I said, No, no, that's not true. You know, but then at the same time it's like he's saying now wicked people receive the union with God and are in the kingdom automatically. And so they experience they experience the kingdom or the aka the glory, right? They experience that as hell. So that's not true. I said they're outside. That is why they're tormented through severe fiery trials and testing. And so I just thought it was, that was weird. What does it say? Calling the kettle black. I don't know if that's the right expression, but I, I said, I keep saying, God is the cause of hell because hell is his very presence. That is what it means for God to be eternal fire. You even admit he is hell. The evil one isn't in the lake of fire till the judgment. Uh, that is till the presence of God fills all, right? Fills all things. Because yeah, God is everywhere present today, yet they're not in hell, right? And so he says, he responds, The kingdom is the actual view of glory as light. When you view the glory as fire as hell, both heaven and hell are relationship to God. This is where I said, when one is wicked, he is glorified. I said, what scripture says we are called for. Kingdom and glory, First Thessalonians 2.12. So the kingdom actually is to view and be in the majestic glory of God. Uh, the wicked want to experience the glory as kingdom and heaven as hell fire. And he says the wicked have free will, but God in his glory is omnipresent. There is no place where God is not. So hell is not a created place. That hell is not. There is simple hell is the status of the wicked. Well, he says something. So God is everywhere, therefore. Yeah, but nobody is in hell right now, yet God is everywhere. And yet he doesn't understand that hell is a temporal condition, a place, a conditional place. And so it's not literally the fire of God himself. And he even admits that some experience that fire as light, right? Yeah, light in paradise. So how can he say and, and act that it's only it's of hell? No, it's just your relationship to it. And so how is your relational like status not temporal? That's what I'm saying. He presupposes the idea that sin itself is eternal. When it's not, I said, uh, I said that I responded to him. I said, It is a created place for the wicked, since sin is temporal and not everlasting, just like eternal damnation. Hell is a temporal condition, and eternal damnation is a false teaching, as I've stated, because it's not an eternal state of being. I said, The wicked aren't in the kingdom. I keep saying that because he doesn't understand. Uh, nor, they, nor the glory, they, they don't have, they don't partake of the tree of life in the kingdom. He says, I told him, Adam and Eve, fallen man, are driven out of paradise. They don't partake of the kingdom, nor the tree of life, because of their state of being. You've caused a contradiction again, saying the wicked are in the kingdom, receiving it as hell, when that is outside the kingdom, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Only the righteous are in the kingdom with the tree of life. Yeah, because even the, the cherubim, right, and the fiery sword, guards the entrance to the, to the tree of life right, in paradise. 
And so that's what I'm saying. How, how are the wicked in the kingdom? Because he thinks they receive the glory. And that's why I said it's not from the Bible. Like to be in the same place in the presence of God. I understand what he says. The fact that they relate and they experience God differently shows that one is in the kingdom and one is not. And so it's not this. Like to be in the same place at the same time in the same sense. He says they're in the kingdom. So he thinks they're in the same in the same sense they're in the kingdom, but they're not. So heaven and hell can be in the same place, meaning the presence of God, but not in the same sense, because they're not both in the kingdom. And then I quote to him the passage in the Bible, Revelations 22, 1 through 21. Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they may have the right to the tree of life, and they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral, murderers and adulterers, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. And so that's what I'm saying. Um, and he, it's the same. It kind of deteriorated after that. He's going back and forth with the same issue. Being in the kingdom and not in the kingdom. The, he says, uh, where, where, where do you say the wicked get in the kingdom? Show me my post. I don't know what he's saying. So. Show me my post that suppose claim such, that he claims such a thing, right? That's what he's saying to me. And I responded to him. I said, you, you did say it. He said, you said heaven and hell are the same place, and you stated how the wicked receive the kingdom as hell, which you say is a bad translation for the glory. Not even Adam and Eve could partake of the kingdom with their fallen state of being. They are cast out like all wickedness, right? Yeah, because why does he cast them out? To protect them from, you know, continuing in such a damaged condition. And yet he says in the very end that God lets these people in their damaged condition in the kingdom where they partake of the tree of life and continue in corruption for all eternity. That's totally backwards. He said, the fact that it is a state of being, speaking of the hell caused by sin, which is spiritual death. Death had been traveled down death by death, including spiritual death. That is why it isn't eternal. You've created two types of hell, eternal fire, and fire due to sinfulness, right? Which is spiritual death. I said, when he says something, uh, just, it's just the same old thing. Same old. Just going back and forth. Um, over this idea of what heaven and hell is. He says, you actually call Jesus a liar. As he says, the wicked will go to eternal hell. Eternal hell for those others says eternal life. So in your logic, then there can't be an eternal, also eternal life, also as retarded. But the sin is not eternal because after death you can't sin, and after the general revelation there will be no sin. That's weird because he says so. It, so he needs. See, that's what I'm talking about. He needs sin to be eternal because he says if 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 um, hell is temporal, then so is heaven, right? That's like saying if, if wickedness is temporal, then so is, so is righteousness. Like if if wickedness is not everlasting in value, then neither is righteousness, and that's absurd. How good and evil are not everlasting. Only that which is good is, is everlasting. And I said, don't confuse eternal everlasting value, which is godly and righteousness. It's not it's not ungodly sin and spiritual death, right? That's like ungodly, like sin ungodliness and spiritual death are not everlasting in value. That's an everlasting judgment. This is not a fire that is, as you've stated, the fire of, like, I don't know, I said something. It came out weird. I was talking about, like, everlasting judgment. The everlasting fire, like, the glory, the kingdom of God. All that is everlasting. Not sin. So that's my whole point. He goes about, he just keeps saying about how he, he reads the original languages and all that. And then it's like, okay, well, your idea doesn't come from scripture. That's all about how this, most of the stuff on how the mess, like a, the mess, bad translations and stuff like that. Last, all I said was, um, it says,
See, I said that even if heaven and hell was God himself, hell is a temporal state of being because it's a condition of the soul in relation to God from what you've explained. And I, I keep saying God isn't literally hell since sinners in the presence of God experience hell, yet sin is temporal and not everlasting. So the translations of Matthew, which shouldn't even be translated into hell, is highly misleading. Just like this idea that hell is an eternal state of being because of God or eternal fire. But the eternal fire isn't just consuming fire. It also illumines, heals. It doesn't, it doesn't just consume and destroy. Uh, wickedness. Uh, this is, I told him that you know, he doesn't understand. So I just kind of kept going in circles. And that, yeah, I think I'll just stop reading. But anyway, that's all I wanted to say on this idea. Like my problem with this man's reasoning and his teaching that's not from scripture. Yeah, and I'm arguing with another one, right? Another, another Orthodox Christian was asking me, like, what must I do to be universally saved? I'm like, what do you mean what you must do? And I was responding him to if, yeah, I asked him that question. What do you mean by what must I do to be universally saved? I told him that you're dead, you're dead men. I say, you are dead, man. You died in, and buried in Christ, right? You died in trespasses. It's like what Paul says, if one died, all died, right? And if one is risen, then all are risen. Some and two, you could say, um, hell and or condemnation, right? Others to life. Um, yeah, that's because that's based upon what is everlasting, which is judgment, not sin. How God is everlasting judgment doesn't lead to eternal damnation, but it leads to their, their um, how do you say, inevitable salvation, which is a harsher way to obtain that, I guess, but I want to continue. It says, you can do nothing to be universally saved. Uh, that depends on the faith of Jesus Christ himself. If he has not risen, your faith is in vain. And so universal salvation is Christ-centered, not man. And then he says, yes, he tells me, do you know anything about me? I ask only about, uh, I guess he thought I was talking about him directly, he says. I only ask because you say I died and was buried with Christ and I have faith. So are you saying that about me or saying that it's just all automatically done? No matter who I am, what I've done or not, done what I believe or don't believe, etc. And I was saying, sorry, I was speaking of what Paul said. Uh, Therefore, just as through one man sin into the world and to death, and I mean, and death through sin, and does death spread to all men because all sin? Uh, this is for until the, the law sin. Uh, but until the law, sin was in the world, but uh, as I said, it's not imputed there when there is no I said, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. And I said, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who is to come. But the free gift is not like the offense, for if by one man's mm -hmm. offense uh, many, many died much more the grace of God and the gift of uh, the gift uh, the gift by the grace of the one man Jesus Christ abounded um, to many and the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification for if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness, which will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Uh, therefore, as to one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteousness act. A one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification to of life. For it's just by one man's obedience, uh, disobedience, yeah, through one man's disobedience, Many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience. Many will be made righteous. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he said to the woman, quote, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. End quote. Luke 7.50, Romans 5.1, Romans 5.12-19. Yeah, and when he's talking about like, Therefore, being justified by faith. The problem with the Protestant understanding is that they assume that it is by faith alone in Jesus, but it's really saying, as he says afterwards, 
All right, pause. I think this is Paul. He says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So being justified through the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking about the faith of Jesus Christ, right? And that's what I said, that universal salvation is the testimony of that faith mm -hmm. of that man, Jesus. It is the logical consequence of his obedience. That is what universal salvation is. That's why I cannot say it depends on your obedience. Otherwise, that would take away from the testimony of Jesus' faith. And so why must one be baptized and believe? Because he asked me later, like, what about baptism? What about repentance? I said, repent and believe the gospel because the gospel is true. It's true. And part of that is Christ is the Savior of all people, the Savior of the whole world. When you take out all these Calvinist presuppositions or whatever, the Reformed position that all doesn't mean all. I guess it does when it comes to salvation. For just like all men are condemned, they are also redeemed. In the same exact sense, same exact sense, as he is Adam, the Adam of God, that is. So that's basically the idea I'm trying to articulate to this Orthodox Christian. And I bring up the passage where it says, where Jesus says, your faith has saved you, right? To that woman, just go in peace. And so likewise, as it says prior, right? Uh, no, I said, as, as I was quoting from the other verse, when, when it says before, uh, therefore being justified by faith, which is Jesus. So in that sense, he has saved us in the sense he has healed us from sin, death, and Satan. That which you call the conquering of sin, death, and Satan, which is the conquering of hell. Right? That's why I said that hell, eternal hell, cannot possibly be the same place. One is temporal, one is this, like, it's talking about, the other one's talking about God. Uh, even through the such a condition, right? Call the eternal hell. It doesn't presuppose endless duration of torment, because the torment through, due to spiritual death has to do with the hell of sin, death, and Satan. So the conquering of hell is the conquering of that one. So eternal hell is also a temporal condition because God is light, His paradise, right? And all are conformed to that. And so that's what I said, that hell eventually is not this eternal damnation, or this place, this eternal place called eternal damnation, or the doctrine I mean eternal damnation, but I'm sorry, I'm trying to gather my thoughts. And so, anyway, but that, that's what I'm saying, that it is by this one man's faith that we are justified. So faith heals, right, if you believe it. And so Jesus, right, has healed us from sin, death, and Satan, the Redeemer of all creation. That is, that's why I said the testimony of this man's faith, the gospel of the conqueror, this conqueror, Jesus. That's what I said, that, that is the testimony of his faith, the consequence of this conqueror, this uh, Adam of God, right? Jesus. And so that's why I bring up that verse about the faith of Jesus, how faith heals, faith saves. I said, yeah, that is grounded in Jesus' faith. And I said... I continued, uh, man is justified by the Son of God regardless of their lack of faith or disobedience. Since justification and the salvation of all is grounded eternally in the faith and faithfulness of Christ. Just like the faith of that woman saved her, likewise the faith of the Son of God saved us. And so, and he responds with, he says, he says you know, he wrote some article titled, why, um, he says, why I'm not a universalist and no one else is either. I says, but I, in, I did end up meeting an actual universalist, and it was terrifying since it utterly collapsed ethics. I'm sure I understand how it's regardless of their lack of faith, since it's not regardless after all, since, quote, the faith of the woman saved her, end quote. Yeah, but the, that's what I'm saying. Whether one has faith in Jesus, is he risen or is he not? And so, you know, this entire, like, I'm going back and forth with this one, this Orthodox Christian, it's like, Either Jesus has a true testimony of faith or he doesn't. So, why, why does one believe? Why be baptized? Why, be, why repent? Because the gospel is true. And that does presuppose Jesus being Lord, Messiah, right, King, and also the Savior of the whole world. That's part of it. And um, there's a whole point of repent and believe the gospel and be baptized. Not because you don't want to go to hell, you know. It's because, no, you believe this is true and you want to conform to this way of thinking. That is the whole point of repenting and belief, right? 
uh, repenting of false images of God, of reality, and be conformed to this reality. That's the whole point. Because it is true, right? And so I'm saying, universalist, the biblical one is grounded in Jesus himself, exactly like the incarnation, the recapitulation, the resurrection, the ascension. Uh, Jesus is all of these. Uh, the apocalypse is just as essential. And to take it from it is to distort the other doctrines of being fully God and fully man. Even being truly Adam, it all falls apart without the apocalypse. Yeah, because the idea is like, how much, if, if a created creature is creative dust, right, can cause the fall of an entire creation, even the cosmos, then you have this other person, right, who is the divine son that is conceived by nature, divine, right, is the Adam of God, a man who is born divine, is the Adam of God, man from heaven who's God in the flesh, and yet whose act of obedience cannot undo the disobedience of a creature. That calls into question how much of the Logos Jesus was, how much of Adam he truly was. Was he truly man? Was he truly God in the flesh, right? Was he truly, was he fully divine? How it falls apart because it's like, well, maybe he was not fully divine then. Maybe he wasn't truly man. Why are some things, like the whole of humanity, the body of humanity, is not saved? And yet he is called the Adam. Maybe he was not. And so that's what I'm saying, how it ties into those things. And you can't just break it off and condemn it as heresy and then think you're not affecting all the other doctrines. And so I continue, I say, I, I mean faith saves. The faith of Jesus is at the heart of all the doctrines I've listed. Above man's disobedience or lack of faith cannot change anything that Christ did. Is it the eternal consequences of his obedience? I've shown in this video, this is in my video that I'm talking about, in a more simple way, using symbol and imagery, right, of why universal salvation is true. And yeah, we're talking about ethics, right? Ethical living, and universal salvation doesn't lead to ethical living. And I said, uh, eternal, eternal damnation is a terrible idea, since faith comes by hope, not fear of punishment. Uh, just watch, uh, yeah, I was talking about Brother Augustine, his debate with Dr. Bob and how eternal damnation, the fear from such a doctrine, frame one's thinking in terms of fear-based theology. Yeah, he truly thinks what Brother Augustine believes is blasphemous. And so it's not wisdom. And so this guy, right, Dr. Bob's like saying all these bad things, demonizing like the way Orthodox believe. You know what I mean? I said, well, that is the way they believe. That is according to Byzantium Christianity. That is their vision of Christianity. That is their unique form of Christian faith. Right, their historical faith like that. It's just the way they think, you know. Even though, like, I don't agree with everything, or for Christianity, but I don't agree with, like, demonizing someone's tradition, you know. And so all of it is, like, it's based on fear. And it's like, I was also thinking about it as well. It's like, ethical living presupposes an ethical view of God, right? The right view of God. And so, I don't know, it's like, I was reading from that book, from my other video, um, something about the damned or something, posthumous salvation, right, of the dead, or rescue for the dead, that's what it's called, and uh, I was just thinking, like, how Augustine, you know, St. Augustine is, like, encouraging this lady, uh, applauding this lady for thinking this thought that her infant burning in hell, right, uh, just, just for wanting her infant to be resuscitated. So just so the infant can be baptized and be saved. Because it's the baby's going to burn in hell, right? And I said how that is... Or how that idea is demonic, right? It's like... How, how is it that um, people sacrifice their own children to, to gods, right? Child sacrifice and stuff like that. And I said how Paul says, take every thought captive for the glory of God. And what happens if your view of glory is perverted? As I was showing with this other person, right? Or other, other, other even uh, deformed or reformed theology. Sometimes I call it deformed theology. It's so deformed. He said, take, take every thought captive, right? For the glory of God. And yet, you think ideas like an infant burning in hell. Therefore, uh, you should baptize these infants or they'll burn in hell or something. 
and they think that God and, the, and the, this one great saint applauds this idea that this is a good thing, right? Because to be in fear in this way is a good thing, at least to righteousness, right? No, it doesn't. It leads to lack of faith, leads to apostasy, leads to difficulties that how one can reconcile such an idea. You can't. So it, it leads to like imitation of faithfulness, imitation, imitation of right living, but it's not ethical. Because you don't live believing in an ethical God to begin with, because the thought, those kinds of thoughts, right, are indeed not righteous, not from God. So to accept those thoughts as good and righteous is to pervert one's mind, which is a perversion of the mind, right? As, the salvation of God is meant to save mind, body, and soul, will, everything. That which Christ is, right? That's why I said that the Apocalypse is basically a man, Jesus. And so certain things don't enter the mind of God, like child sacrifice, right? As God says in the Old Testament, that such a thing does not enter his mind. That is the ideas of men who are perverse in their carnal minds, right? And so that's what I said. Uh, eternal damnation is the one that leads to unethical living. It doesn't lead to righteous living, holiness and all that stuff that these people think, think that in their delusion, they think that this doctrine is producing this, this wonderful thing when it's not. It's totally backwards. And so he says, he says, I certainly get your meaning since, quote, masses of disobedience or lack of faith cannot change anything that Christ did and on your view he saved universally when he accepts, quote, man's disobedience or lack of faith, end quote, so that even people who specifically deny what, quote, Christ did, end quote, are just as saved as those who accept it. Even men who fly airplanes into buildings in the name of a false god who will be right next to you in heaven praising Christ apparently. Then I responded to him with, Apparently you think men flying into buildings, uh, bombing people, uh, somehow means salvation doesn't extend to the worst of the worst. I said, grace can reach the worst of the sinners. Apparently something you cannot grasp. I said, this is a faithful, this is a faithful saying uh, and worthy of all acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. At 1 Timothy 1.15 I said, Paul persecuted the church at one point, but apparently grace cannot save him. And I was like, seriously, like, because this idea is that well, everyone's just going to be saved regardless of what they do. And I'm like, no, I'm saying that Jesus is the Savior of the whole world. That is why you should repent and believe the gospel, that which he has conquered, right? Because that is what is true. Because it is true. That's how he's the true image of God and stuff like that. So none of it presupposes the idea that people are just automatically saved. He says, the key difference, he responded to me, he said, the key difference is that I affirm that men who fly airplanes into buildings in the name of a false god, which is what I wrote, will be saved if they repent. You affirm that, quote, men who fly airplanes into buildings in the name of a false god are automatically saved. Thus, you utterly collapse ethics. Uh, your pseudo-gospel is literally, quote, do what thou wilt shall be, the, uh, shall be the whole of the law, end quote. Thus, you are taking text out of context and to make pretexts for proof texts whereby to encourage people to do whatever they want, including disagree with you and still being irresistibly saved. So he made a lot of presuppositions there. Like I never I don't believe in irresistible save, salvation, whatever it was. I never said that it's automatically saved. I never said any of that. I said this I said I responded to him and I said, if they repent and believe and be baptized, they will be saved. Sure. Sure. Faith saves, and so the key difference for a biblical universalist is that the faith of the Son of God saves all who saves the, um, all of the whole creation. Uh, the gospel, just like uh, this universalism, is the testimony of his faith. It's Christ-centered. Repentance and baptism is necessary, not simply because joining an institution of Christian religion, but because the gospel is true. I said no sin can undo Christ's testimony of faith. Yeah, because the way I look at it is like, what sin can undo the incarnation? Can undo the cross? Can undo anything that Jesus did? And so whether one believes or not, does it change anything? That's the, point, that's the foundational you know, point that I'm trying to articulate. That you, know, you should believe because it is true. That is why you should believe. Do what is right because God is right. right? Be faithful because God is faithful. It's not because of a place of torment. Like I understand like some people uh, may not see it that way, I guess. And so yeah, you should fear judgment. But... Eternal damnation has nothing to do with eternal judgment or everlasting judgment. And I said eternal damnation absolutely does not 
save the mind. It creates people like jihadists. Why should people fear hell when they fear hell? When they fear, the fear of hell is overcome with the fear of God. Uh, jihadists most likely do evil because of their faith in a false image of God. So eternal damnation cannot save the mind of a jihadist. And he says, they just didn't understand the position. Like, they just go back and forth saying, this is just says, he's not, he's not sure what I'm saying. And he wanted to start all over. He says, what must I do? He's just asking me the same question. Like, what must I do to be saved? Because if I don't need to do anything, then you can ignore repentance and baptism. If I need to do something, then that's not what is traditionally meant by universal salvation. And I respond to him, and I just said, what must I do is, a, is the wrong question. It is more like if Christ is not risen, then your faith is in vain. It hangs upon Christ himself, not on your own personal flawed obedience. Universal salvation is simply the consequence of the obedience of the second Adam. So I guess what it says, like, if it hangs upon your obedience, then you will never be saved. You know how man is so disobedient, and man is always in his delusion that he is obedient when he's not. How Jesus shows you how you're not really this obedient thing. You're actually very disobedient. That's why it is better to understand it from that foundational proof. Justification by the faith of the Son of God. Universal salvation has the testimony of his faith. That's what I'm saying. And then this uh, Orthodox is commenting to me. It was about the double subject Christology. Obviously, you know, it's not the Orthodox position. Orthodox position is a uh, one subject Christology. And it's ties. This way, this guy said, uh, he said, why do you preach against what the Orthodox Church teaches? While, call your, while calling yourself Orthodox. He says, quote, His glory proclaimed His divine nature, which is from the Father, and His body proclaimed His human nature, which was from Mary. Both of His natures converged and were united in a single hypostasis person. He was the only begotten of the Father and also the only begotten of Mary. And He who divides hypostasis person in him will also be separated from his kingdom, and he who conjoins his natures will be deprived of the life that is of him. End quote. St. Ephraim the Syrian, so he's quoting St. Ephraim the Syrian to me, and he continues, and he says, elsewhere he says, quote, we confess one and the same individual as perfect God and perfect man. He is God, the Word, which was flesh, end quote. Then he says to me, your teaching condemned heresy, Please repent and submit to what the church teaches instead of turning the faith into an exercise of rationalism. And then they'll, um, he quoted the saint, right? This is what the saint's talking about. I mean, just listen to how the saint words everything. His human nature, which was from Mary, both his natures converged, right? His, one, his divine nature is from the Father. They're talking about united in a single hypostasis person. He was only begotten, a father and only begotten of Mary. He who divides hypostasis this person is in, in him who will be separated from his kingdom. It says he who conjoins his natures will be deprived from life that is in him. And so honestly, it just sounds like this person is this saint is rationalizing, you know, the understanding of how exactly is he God. So you confess he's one individual. We confess that he's man, but it's like, I don't know, my problem that I see is that who is really the one rationalizing? It's like, to me, it sounds like you're desperately wanting to believe that he's truly one person and as one person is doing both godly, right? Godly and human things. Just being one person. Because he has two God, like he has two natures. And so you're just like, especially when you hear a lot of these not just Orthodox, but, you know, traditional Christians believe in this hypostatic union. It's like, they always stress that he suffers and he dies. He feels pain and sorrow and fear, all in, in his human nature, right? Quote, in his human nature, end quote, right? That's what I'm saying. Like, it's like, why go to such great lengths to explain in his human nature, to emphasize in his human nature? It just sounds to me like, these people don't really believe that he's a man. 
And so this is what I responded with. I said, oh, you confess an individual that doesn't exist. Uh, the word was God, which, you know, yeah, the word was with God. The word was God. I say it's a right hand, logos, pre-existing light. I said, that is that is nature, not person. Because the word was not a God, which means pre-existing person. Uh, the son is a man, a man. And then that man is the light, the father's logos in the flesh. And here's where I explain the spirit of God, right? As, as being the only divine person, that sounds remotely similar to what people who believe in the hypostatic union, well, how they're explaining about how the, the word takes, or the divine person takes flesh, right? And yet uh, they say that the word becomes flesh, but they don't mean becoming a human nature or a human person. They just change it and say that the word becomes unified to an impersonal nature. And so this is what I said, continuing. The Spirit of God is the divine person that, quote, takes flesh, and quote, a human being, and is in his temple, human nature, which always belongs to two persons, God and man, which is also Son and Spirit, right? That is from the scriptures, as it says, quote, ye are the temple of God, end quote. I just told him, I didn't, I didn't confuse the person, but simply put them in their proper place. I, I reason with God a lot about this issue. I was praying a lot about it, and the idea that I was getting was, like I said before in my other video, like the, the easiest way to refute the one subject Christology is hypostatic union, is just asking the simple question, how many persons does the temple belong to? Does it belong to God? Does it belong to man? Right? Or does it belong to both God and man? All children of God are, you know, filled or involved by the Spirit of God. So by saying it's just one person with two natures, how he's doing godly and divine things, it's like totally denying the man's union with his God or the son's union with his father, right? Because you turn this person into a deity. This is kind of the same thing with, uh, you know, like, like, like when some orthodox, I was watching this one person debate, a Turretin fan, I think it's Craig Tegulia. He was mentioning how uh, when Jesus does miracles, he said that is like, a, he says that is a very divine thing, right? But it's his, like, according to his, you know, God nature or something. Yeah, but it's like, then it's, and I commented, and nobody responded, but I said, okay, but when, when, when you're talking about miracles, right, it's like, well, Paul and Peter, like, Peter healed someone with his shadow, and then, uh, Paul, right, he resurrected, a, you know, a dead child or so just by, you know, holding him or something. It was all in the same passage, right? And I said, okay, so do they have the divine nature, this, this God nature, right? So how exactly do they do the miracles? So I said, they don't have the divine nature when they do miracles, the God nature. I said, so I said, the Logos should be something distinctly divine. It shouldn't be just because he's, you know, like, I don't know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be confused with, like, the God nature that omnipotence and all that stuff or whatever but anyway I told him I was speaking to this Orthodox Christian and told him submission to the church always also presupposes understanding the mind of the, of the church so there's no contradiction or problem with what I'm doing yeah because the way I see it is that if, I, if I'm supposed to have your mind and understand how you think then I have to have, have to ask questions I have to pray about it to understand how to just to understand how to think like you and so it's not like that's what I said it's like you can call something infallible but it's like and I'm holding it in my hand some object in my hand that you think is like of everlasting value but then it falls apart in my hand it's not it's not my problem and so that's what I said it's not uh, an issue of authority with me it's just you have to try every spirit you know I don't believe in traditionalism I think that's kind of idolatry Especially when you have tradition over truth. It's supposed to go hand in hand. Or at least truth should be held over tradition. And so that's why I say I can never think like 
some of these Orthodox Christians who think just believe and and be uh, obedient. Why well, can't just people obey, right? Like some of these Orthodox think. Like, wait, people just obey that everything will be more unified. So, no, because people, you know, are endowed with freedom. They have a right of conscience. And so people can just not accept this stuff, especially after what I know, like, as far as this teaching, this one subject, Christology, I can honor my right conscience, promote it like it's true, even though I know it's not true. And it's like we're worried about church unity. And I ask, what, what church unity are you talking about? I said, you you already broken off into so many different parts. But all, all you do is, uh, like, some of these Orthodox, like, they just refer to all these other people, like, Orthodox, like, uh, Coptics and Assyrians, Orientals, Ethiopians, etc. It's like, they're looked at as schismatic, so, you know. But the fundamental problem is already in this, in this understanding, though. How it doesn't, it's not from Scripture. Anyways, this Orthodox Christian responded with, I confess the one hypostasis of Christ, because that's what the church confesses and the Holy Fathers teach. It is one thing to hold an opinion in a private, but to publicly teach against the church's teachings, while claiming to be orthodox, right? while claiming to belong to the church is another matter. The problem is your line of reasoning is not in accordance with the mind of the church. I urge you to read the Holy Fathers, both ancient and contemporary, on this matter, because you are misrepresenting the orthodox church and her teachings. And I responded with, Well, I'm only a catechumen. Everyone submits to their own church. So it's not a great idea. Because yeah, everyone is submitting to their own church. It's like every, everyone, if everyone just obeyed without asking questions, then especially with, with how fractured all these churches are, then nobody would tr truly repent and believe the truth. They would just be told what they're what to do, what, what to say and all that. <laughs> Whatever, I mean, it's, I'm not saying it's like it's wrong to obey, but I'm saying that you're obviously not willing to understand the deeper issues of preventing what's preventing church hit, you know, church unity or whatever. It's like it seems like all of these all of these institutions are for church unity, so long it's them that benefits the most, whoever it is, right? So long as it's according to them, right? And so I continue and I say con con conforming one's thinking to the mind of the church will always presuppose the truth. That tradition should be according to what is true, not what is politically correct. I'm not rep I'm not representing you. I say what Orthodox believe. When I mean when I say that, I mean Orthodox Christianity. I say what Orthodox believe in Christology. Uh, I say what Orthodox believe in Christology and state how its foundation is not from Scripture. So how is this not the same as a private interpretation, according to someone's personal theology? I said democracy. And a monarchy is not a good way to do theology. It's literally similar to justifying doctrine by a popular vote because of the union of church and state, right? I was asking, asking, I was asking this question because at the end of the day, you, you appeal to the church, but the church is one with the state. And so that's how you get you know, government involved with you know Christology and theology and things like that. Dictating what is to be believed as well, like the church not being distinct or separate from the state and cause this kind of problem. This is why it's not just a simple issue of just claiming fallibility. It says, no, there's a lot of politics involved. And so, and this Orthodox responded with, when the church has councils condemning the idea of two hypostases, when the church has liturgical prayers confessing one hypostasis of Christ, and the Father confesses one hypostasis, then this is not a matter of political correctness, but rather where the Holy Spirit has revealed as truth through the body of Christ, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Also, I never said you misrepresented me. I said you, you misrepresented the teachings of the Orthodox Church. Yeah, but that's what I was, that's what I was talking about. I wasn't, speaking, I wasn't speaking specifically about this person. And continues, I'm glad you confirmed that you're a catechumen, though as I suspected you have not been initiated into the mysteries yet. Perhaps it would be better to be fully and properly catechized before teaching. I said, uh, I said, we are struggling to have proper catechumen classes, uh, but the Christological issues will still remain. The traditional Christology, according to the apostles themselves, is double subject. Uh, you have to demonstrate why it is error, as I've shown. 
the errors of the one subject Christology. A uh, majority vote doesn't establish the teaching as infallible. The majority can still be wrong. Yeah, because the way I see it is that that a council is called to deal with an issue between two bishops and how some of their followers, some of their monastics are violent, that the emperor has to get involved, right? Because it's really also mainly preserving the, the union of church and state. That's also why I think so. Not just about what is the truth according to the apostolic tradition, but also how to keep the peace within the church and the state, right? And so this thought that the issue is Nestorianism, but he, you know, his orthodox is clearly saying that not, not only the, the teaching of two sons is condemned, but the double subject in general is condemned as well. And yet, it's perfectly taught from Scripture. And yet you wonder why it's like you have all these schisms, right? And so one's personal theology, I mean, it's like, I don't know, it's like, who, whose idea is it to be one subject? How is that not like a personal, how is that not, how is that not another way of a private interpretation or something? That it's just done some other way instead of it being just centered on one person, which it kind of is. It's like, you have a dispute, it's a dispute between two persons in the council and many people are swayed by one person. And so it's like one gets condemned to heretic, the other doesn't. And so everyone kind of conforms their way of thinking to this one person's way of thinking, an entire council, right? Shaping the mind of the church through councils, through these theological, these Christological disputes. I mean, how's that not favoring one's private interpretation? I mean, if I might missing something. But anyway, that's all I'm going to say. And uh, yeah, I'll just stop it there. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. If you like my videos, please like and subscribe. Thank you and God bless.